To those of you here tonight, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and to those of you who are watching this DVD in other parts of the world at different times, greetings to you. Now you see in your notes that you've got in your hand, there are numbered paragraphs down on the left hand side to, uh, so you can keep, we can keep together as we go along. So that title, Breaking News, Predicted and Fulfilled, encases my subtitle, is how I came to believe the most up-to-date political book, the Bible. We go down to paragraph two. So whatever title you wish to use, perhaps you should ask me five questions. One, have I always believed the Bible? Two, if not, what did I believe before? Three, what convincing evidence did I find to cause me to believe it? Four, what are the benefits of believing it? And five, are there any obligations, or duties, or responsibilities involved in believing it? Now, to answer those questions for you, I shall have to press what one might call the rewind button on the tape of my life's journey and go back almost to the start, paragraph three. To get to this hall this evening, you had to embark on a journey, short, medium, or long distance. It wasn't straight. There were turns to the left and turns to the right, maybe diversions and detours, until you arrived at your final destination and stopped. This evening, we are going to take two more journeys. The first, an overview of life's journey, which every human being is on. And the second, you will be accompanying me as I retrace my life's journey to find satisfying answers to life's problems. But tonight, our objective is, as we read in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4, to come unto a knowledge of the truth. In so reviewing my journey, God willing, I hope it causes you to start and finish a similar journey. Paragraph 5. Remember the Chinese proverb, a journey of 1,000 li starts with one small step. A li is a Chinese measurement equivalent to half a western kilometre. So a journey of 500 western kilometres starts with one small step. And if you don't start, you'll never complete it. So, um, some things will be a bit strange to you tonight in events that have happened to my life and in my upbringing in England, and as I say, they would, might appear quite strange to you here in New Zealand. So, we are now at paragraph six, and we need a picture up on the wall, please, thank you. And first, an overview of everybody's journey through life in this easily remembered illustration. As I said, everybody in this world takes this journey. This is a photo from a National Geographic magazine, and it's part of the River Jordan, the border between, I'll use the old terms, Palestine and the Hashemite kingdom of the Transjordan. I know it's changed now. Its source is the melting snows of Mount Hermon, and 
they flow into a narrow river and a small lake and a narrow river again and then into Lake Tiberias or sometimes called the Sea of Galilee. There are three noticeable features on, of this river at this point where it was taken. It's a torturous, twisting course. I'm not following it exactly, but I think you can see it there. And it's rather serpentine. It is, has a noticeable descent. In fact, its name means descender. And it has an abrupt, unusual end at the Dead Sea. No life. And at school, we knew it as being 1292, or 1,292 feet below sea level, the lowest point on Earth. It seems to have risen somewhat since, because it's now described as 1280 feet below sea level, that is, below normal ground level. And in paragraph 7 of your notes, we still keep the picture up there, what life's lessons do these features teach us in the individual life of a human being? For simplicity's sake, the River Jordan starts at Lake Tiberius. We'll just say for the moment it starts there, which is teeming with fish life. A person is born. The parents have a high expectation of their child. It develops uh, perhaps through kindy and primary school, intermediate school, maybe unemployed, maybe uni, or maybe get an apprenticeship. In other words, it's twisting and turning all the way along as people change their mind and different decisions are made. A person in their life may change their house, their suburb, the city, the island, immigrate, they go on a great OE, change jobs, careers, marry, divorce, change partners, healthy, sick, whatever, friends and relatives, as they go through life, twisting and turning this way and that, and going down and down and down the whole time. And eventually they die until... Uh, yes, until everybody in turn, somewhere, sometime, dies. Now, paragraph 8 in your notes. Life of a human being has limitations. A person's lifespan is short, or middle age, or as long as Psalm 90 verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if, by reason of strength, they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, strain and pain, for it is soon cut off. Life ends somewhere, sometime, somehow. It has stopped at its final destination, dead below the normal level of the earth, the grave. A question might come to your mind, is that its final destination? And we shall see. Paragraph 9. If Christadelphians are new, a new name to you, you will find some have had Christadelphian parents They went to Sunday school. New Circle, Bible schools, and in their own time became Christadelphians themselves. Others, like many in here and myself, at some time, some point in their lives, came in contact with Christadelphians and took the trouble to compare, to investigate what they said with what the Bible said and in due course were convinced that Christadelphians were right. And so these people came into the truth. 
paragraph 10. Now, for my life's journey, which, as I've said before, is not the same as yours. And I've said before, perhaps it's going to seem rather strange. We lived in the countryside in Essex, 30 miles from London by road. There was an ex-policeman's house who, unfortunately, had his throat cut when he went to arrest people for stealing corn. In the 1930s, this same two-storey brick house had no kitchen, no bathroom, no electricity, and therefore no running hot water, no telephone. Light in the evenings was by hurricane lamp, sometimes called a storm lantern. One of these things with paraffin in the bottom and a glass um, sort of bowl with wire around it, handle on the top. And that was all we had to illuminate what we were doing at the dining room table. There was no proper back door. In fact, the back door was in two halves, like a stable door. And perhaps the policeman kept his horse in the winter next door to the dining room door, and there was an uneven brick floor straight onto the earth. And perhaps that was where he put his horse in the window. The lavatory, well, we go outside the stable doors and down the garden a bit, and the least said the better, otherwise, other than that it was spooky. For bathing, once a week, Saturday evenings, in a metal tub in front of the sitting room fire, the sister and I were scrubbed with one of these scrubbing brushes. Right? especially on the back of the neck, elbows, wrists, and knees. As I said, we only had one of these once a week. No dentists, no doctors, no injections. And I know for eight years we were never sick. I've heard it said, and I'm sure it's true, that too much bathing will weaken you. Must be a lesson there somewhere. We had a very large garden for vegetables. In fact, we grew all our own when my father was out of work. It lasted a whole year. But around the house, there were several flower gardens. Snowdrops, crocuses, bluebells, daffodils, tulips, and irises. And I noticed that though they flowered in their time and died off, they bloomed again the following year and the next year, and so on. And I was curious. Puzzle number one. And paragraph 12, by about five and a half to six, I could read and write, do maths. We did all this on a slate. You didn't have to go to school until you were seven. My paternal grandmother bought me a Bible. I know I read all the strange names and wouldn't have understood one of them. I read at least as far as Exodus chapter 3 because there was a picture of Moses and the burning bush that wasn't burned up. Puzzle number two. There was religion of a sort at home before meals we stood behind our chairs and said, For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. And after meals, we stood behind our chairs again and said, For what we have received, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Paragraph 13. The day after the Silver Jubilee celebrations and processions in London, of King George V and Queen Mary, which we were taken up to London to see, I started school. No buses passed our house. The school at Danbury, the burial place of the Danes, was over four miles away, seven and a half kilometers. We left home at about quarter to eight, 
and got to school about an hour later and finished school at 4 p.m. and walked home. In the summer's long days it was nice, but in the long winter nights, you leave home in the dark. Arrive at school, it's just getting light. It's already dark at four o'clock in the afternoon when we left. And trudge home, maybe in pouring rain, or a thunderstorm, or through a snowstorm. Cold, dark, lonely, winding country roads, and no street lights. Snow was no excuse, was no reason for not going to school. Maybe we should have uh, gone on our toboggans. There was a religion at school, a roll call, a hymn, Bible reading, prayers, hymn, and a line in a hymn in the church hymnal, Hymn 166, in actual fact, we sang it this morning in hymn number 50, at the end of verse 2. There's a line there that uh, worried me. And for his sheep he doth us take. Perhaps God or his winged angels would come in the dark of night and snatch us away, and we'd be cooked and eaten. When I was a child, I thought as a child, we learned 12 different subjects at school, and one of them was scripture. Some of us lived too far away to go home for the midday meal. Some of you might, might know that in parts of England the main meal of the day is at midday. Five is tea time. And Hitler, who liked English customs, copy the English custom of high tea at 5 p.m. Well, we come back to Hitler a little later on. So we sat down to a two-course midday meal, and the headmaster, Mr. Duncan Tugwell, gave thanks. It may be two or three times a year we would hear a muffled boing, boing of the church bell, the belfry uh, in All Saints Church our local church, and that would be sounding like that because of a funeral. And perhaps my younger sister and I, we might ask, for whom the bell tolls? And be told, well, old Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so have died. Um, nice person, have gone to heaven. Or perhaps the other way, I had an appointment with the devil in hell. As Dr. Thomas writes, the church was a sort of policeman keeping order as a religion of fear. And I noticed that when people died, they didn't come back any year. And I was curious. Puzzle number three. Paragraph 15. The church had a very powerful influence over people. January the 20th, 1936, we heard on the wireless about King George V with a quarter chill. The king's life is drawing peaceably towards its close. His death was hastened, hastened by injection to get the timing right for the morning newspaper editions. He was succeeded by his eldest son, David, who became Edward VIII. But he wanted to marry the twice, or was it thrice, divorced American woman, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. The Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, Dr. Cosmo Gordon Lang, spiritual head of the Church of England and many members of Parliament and the government vigorously opposed somebody, especially the King, as going to be head of the Church of England, and marrying somebody who was divorced, and divorced several times at that. So on the 11, December the 11th, 1936, the uncrowned King Edward VIII abdicated and was succeeded by Albert, Duke of York, 
who became King George the Sixth. Three kings in eleven months. Perhaps in 1937 or 38 we started going to church and later I was enrolled against my will in the choir. Life was quiet and uneventful in this little village but you can see from the page, your third page, we're not going to study it at all, there were nine uh, momentous or eventful years going on out, out, yes, overseas. And we'll look at one item there, please, on the picture up there, item paragraph 16, there's a typographical error there apparently, it's a worthless piece of paper. September the 24th, 1938. Um, Neville Chamberlain had come back from visiting Hitler at Gothenburg, and he waved this piece of paper, Peace in Our Time. Remember, this is September 38. From then on, ever so surely, gathering momentum, Britain prepared for war air raid precautions, some dug air raid shelters, everyone got gas masks. You have to have a gas mask because no one will lend you theirs if there's a Germans come over and there's a cloud of gas wafting across the countryside. He learned the smells of poison gases that we went into a room about the size of that one at the back and even as us as little children you take off your gas mask and smell the chlorine gas, the poison gas, and the phosgene, the one that smells like musty hay, and the mustard gas, the brown liquid, it's, if it splatters on you, then we would grab a tuft of grass and wipe it off. Attendance at church continued. Three of us choir boys were prepared for confirmation in the church. We learned the Catechism and the 39 Articles of Faith. These go back to 1562-71, ratified by the Protestant Sovereign Lady Elizabeth, Queen of England, Queen of France and Queen of Ireland. She was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, his second wife. Paragraph 17. Two extracts from these different things we were supposed to learn and remember and believe. Just two of them. There is but one living and true God. Well, that happens to be true. Without body, parts, or passions. Sounds like a will of the wisp to me. In unity with the Godhead, there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in the Catechism, this is the Church of England prayer book, and it's all in here. In the Catechism, I learned to believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Church of England was very, very powerful before the war, especially. The Archbishops of Canterbury and York, and every bishop is entitled to sit in the Upper House of Parliament in England, the House of Lords, where they can vote to make laws or repeal them. Before the war, it had its great influence over ordinary people. And the following might surprise you very much. It was the duty of parents and schools, it's all in here, to give religious instruction to children. The duty and responsibility of those who had servants was out in the country, this would be landowners and farmers and so on and so on. And what would or what type of servants would they have? The one farm near us, I know he had many. They were housemaids, pantry maids, chambermaids, scullery maids, cooks, waitresses at table, governesses, look after the children, milkmaids. 
Let's sit on a three-legged wooden stool. He's not here tonight. No, a three-legged wooden stool to hand milk the cows. The boys in the village, if they couldn't get employment, at 13 and a half, might join the Royal Navy or the Army. If they didn't, they might become grooms, plowboys, or what is called boots. But all these people had to be sent to the church services on Sunday evenings for instruction in the 39 Articles and the Catechism. It was the duty of the people who had the servants to make sure they went. As Robert Robert writes in page 80, on page 87 of his 13 lectures, the church, by law, established. I hate choir practice, and still do, and learning the catechism. But I don't know, I'm sure we didn't really believe it, but us three boys were confirmed at 11 years old into the Church of England by the Bishop of Chelmsford at the cathedral on a Thursday <coughs> evening. And there, then we were able to take part in Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. Paragraph 18. From the Munich crisis, uh, Neville Chamberlain's coming back with peace in our time, the Munich crisis. We prayed for peace, but in a year's time we got war. And you see a little bit there, Purley goes to war, that's the name of the little village. And we had quite a share of things that happened to that village from 39 to 45. So September the 3rd, 1939, we sat in church, the service should have started at 11, but at quarter past 11, Neville Chamberlain uh, came on the air. There was a battery-powered wireless up on the pulpit, and he said, I am speaking to you from the cabinet room of number 10 Downing Street, that we have sent an ultimatum to Herr Hitler and uh, to re remove his troops from Poland. We have had no reply, therefore Britain is at war with Germany. You see a little bit there, all quiet on the Western Front. That refers to the British Expeditionary Force and the French on the borders of Belgium and France from September to April the following year. Nothing much happened. In the village, we got a searchlight and an anti-aircraft gun about a mile away and many, many soldiers in their best uniforms marched into church on Sunday mornings. Paragraph 19. The spring of 1940, Hitler then invaded Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium. You turn over the page now, I think, in your books. And all your notes, and North and Western France to start with. And in England we got the Battle of Britain. And my sister and I used to collect things from shot down aircraft and put them in the, uh, up in the pantry, live ammunition and all that sort of thing which used to scare our Aunt Jane. And we got the Blitz. Saturday, September the 7th, 1940, about 5 p.m., we heard a rumbling sound. We rushed outside in the garden and looked up. And there were 42 German bombers, not very high up, all in neat formation, on their way to London, 20 miles away, as the distance they had to fly. And they bombed the docks and the warehouses, and we saw huge pools of black smoke. And 892 people were killed, and 2,000 uh, were injured. And the Germans bombed London for the next 56 consecutive nights. Uh, 
there's a cup and saucer over there. Uh, the thing that we were supposed to do during the war was keep calm and carry on. But we used to get quite a lot of this. As a German, some of them were scared to go to get shot down, so they unloaded the lot all over the countryside. In, we're paragraph 20 now, in the Sunday church services, the vicar gives a sermon, of course, every Sunday, every evening for 45 minutes. And I remember a certain remark. He said that Christ would return to this earth. My father didn't go to church that day, and he asked me at dinner time, or at lunchtime, what was the sermon about? And that's what I said, that Christ would return to this earth. So now we've got four puzzles. The flowers came back every year. A bush that burned, but was still recognizable. Dead people didn't come back. And Christ would come back. Please remember those four. Paragraph 21. Go through the next one quickly. The next seven years, 1940 to 47, we shall condense. Boarding school, Sunday's church, three times sometimes, go to church on Sundays. The threat of German invasion, the air raids we had, and that moment we go down to the air raid shelters, leave the classroom and go to the air raid shelters. Because of the threat of invasion, I joined the school's army cadets. So now we were 13 and a half. We were firing real rifles and real machine guns and handguns. And there you've got their, was it, Vertogong Ein on Vertogong Zwei. What does that mean? It means retaliation or revenge one and revenge two. The flying bomb, we used to get them. And the V2 supersonic ballistic rocket. One of those exploded about 600 yards from our house. The flash lit up the whole of the countryside. A huge explosion which rocked the house. And then we heard it coming because the sound had to catch up with the rocket after it had exploded. We joined the regular army, and because I joined early, I could choose what I wanted, so I chose tanks. And six months of learning to what makes a tank tick, and yet we had one hour a week of scripture lesson by an army padre. It's strange. Now, I wasn't um, what you might call confident enough to ask questions, but some people started asking awful questions. Because the Catechism teaches that no harm should be done to your neighbor. Yet we were learning to kill him. Did Germans go to church and pray for victory? Would God surely only help England? Wars usually have a break on Christmas Day. After death, British soldiers did, German soldiers did. Did immortal souls of both sides carry on the war in heaven? Revelation 12, verse 7, there was a war in heaven. But did we carry it on up there? Puzzle number five. So I went overseas. Libya, Cyrene, Acts 2, verse 10, Benghazi, Tripoli, and Zavia, south of Melita, Acts 28, verse 1. But I wasn't interested in the Bible in those days. Now you've got paragraph 22. Who was Sergeant Samuel Weaver? My stepmother's father. He was an English person learning sheep farming over here somewhere near Mount Cook before World War I. So he joined the New Zealand Army, the New Zealand Machine Gun Corps. And he fought the Turks, the defense of Suez in 1915. He went to Gallipoli and survived. He fought at the Battle of the Somme in France in 1916. 20,000 dead in one day. He survived. 
and he was a farmer later, after World War I, in Heribertshire. The Ottoman Empire, represented by the river Euphrates in the Bible, Revelation 16 verse 12, was evaporating. It was drying up. It was losing its overseas possessions, started in 1820. Yet still held Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, and Northern Arabia. The Turkish capital is Constantinople. Anyone who controls Constantinople is styled, in the Bible, the King of the North. British forces have been in Egypt since 1882 to protect the canal. And those further south, you see, they are styled the King of the South. Winston Churchill and others in the government had decided on a strategy to knock Turkey, Germany's ally, out the war by taking Constantinople. And they would do this by going through the Dardanelles Straits. But we find God in the Bible is known as the Lord of Hosts, Yahweh of Armies, his prophetic military title. And he had another strategy which Britain and the Anzacs and others seemed to know nothing about. And as Britain is never to be king of the north, God's strategy took precedence. Hence the failure of the Gallipoli campaign. Though my stepmother's father told me about 1943 or 44, when I used to work on his farm in the school holidays, that he was at Suvla Bay, which is a little north-west of Anzac Cove. So in that campaign, thousands dead on both sides in the eight months. But when the Allies withdrew in December 1915, either there were no casualties, or there was only one. So the whole campaign was fighting for a lost cause. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Britain's British troops and Australians under General Sir Edmund Allenby, Allenby in English, al Bay in Turkish, the prophet of God, that scared them, as king of the south, pushed at him, the king of the north, Turkey, and reached Jerusalem on December the 11th, 1917. Colonel Lawrence of Arabia never actually joined the British army, well that's another story, with Emir Faisal's Arabs on the right flank, took Aqaba and they were first into Damascus. Jerusalem and Palestine had been freed of Turkish domination, predicted and fulfilled. One more stride in the direction that the way might be prepared for the kings of the east. Revelation 16 verse 12. When things are done God's way, the results are prosperous. The changeover of the King of the North from Turkey to Russia predicted that could wait for another day. On Al Jazeera News at Channel 16, the Arabic news in English, it showed us that Russia and Turkey at the moment are working hand in glove in certain affairs in that area. So the next step predicted, Daniel 11 verse 40, has not yet been fulfilled in time. Paragraph 23, my British Army service in Palestine, we crossed the Sinai Desert at night and we arrived at Gaza sometime <coughs> August 1947 and we received two shocks. We had crossed, as I said, the Sinai Desert from Egypt, 
and halted at this Gaza station because Jewish terrorists had put mines on the railway tracks to blow up our train. And the second shock, whilst waiting on the Gaza platform, Arab boys running up and down selling Palestinian post, Palestinian post, the way they pronounce Palestine Post, the English language paper. And on a page in that paper was a gruesome photo. The two British special intelligence sergeants, they've been captured by the Ogun Zwei the Jewish terrorist organization. And Palestine now, or then, was turned upside down and inside out by the British Army trying to find those two. They were unsuccessful. In fact, they missed them by a distance of about four feet. But the picture in the paper was of these two sergeants hanging from a eucalyptus tree. One of the bodies had been booby-trapped. It's rather strange that one of my tasks in Palestine was several mornings a week to crawl on my stomach for a certain distance on the railway line, on the, on the tracks, searching for mines. It's a little bit of equipment to do it, and the palms of my hands to find the spikes on the detonators or whatever. As I was in charge of other soldiers, I had to lead from the front and do the dangerous job. And the first mistake one makes in that job is probably the last mistake you'll ever make. But I'm still here. We were required to cross over the River Jordan. I assume we need a picture, please. And, uh, yes. So we crossed the River Jordan from Palestine into Jordan by the Allenbury Bridge. But, uh, this picture here is the Six Day War. Who blew up the bridge? I don't know whether the Jews or whether the Arabs. But when we crossed it 20 years before, it was intact. Uh, next picture, please. And in Jordan, we, somewhere up here, is Kuala de Zerka, where we were stationed. In Palestine itself, we were down here somewhere, I think it's just off the map, this Gadira, Yibna, and Rehoboth. And that was the area we had to uh, protect the railway line to Haifa. What were we doing in Jordan? We were playing war games with live ammunition with the Arab Legion. But I noticed, as we sort of crossed over, that on this side of the River Jordan, the uh, hills are limestone, they are white. But where we were over here, all the, uh, the rocks and the sand is pink or red or brown. And there is a scriptural significance to that. White, righteousness, and red, this side, flesh. And if we move down to the next photo, please, which is somewhere down here, this is the Petra, the rose red city, half as old as time. Well, that's the color of the sand and the rocks over on the uh, on the Jordanian side of the River Jordan. Edom, E-D-O-M, Adam, red, flesh. Thank you. 24. We quickly look at paragraph 24. 1952, I was in the army in Germany and decided that I would uh, give it a break and change uniforms and became uh, into the Merchant Navy on, as a radio officer on a ship. Yes, that's all right in some ways, very really comfortable life, eight hours of Morse code all day, and breakfast, a seven-course breakfast, white starched uniform, and a lot of paperwork 
which I don't like. So after a period of time, I wrote to somebody in the war office whom I knew, got what I wanted, and went back to the army, changed from a merchant navy uniform back into the army to Malaya, paragraph 25, to fight communist terrorists. But though we had many deaths in three years in Germany, deaths were more frequent and close up in Malaya. Very stressful. And it affected me of decisions I made. For example, I'll give you two examples. One morning at dawn, we were, I was in my armored car, looking out, staring into the um, darkness, and 14 crouching figures went across in front of me. Because we'd set a trap, an ambush for terrorists. And anybody there should have been shot. But for some reason, I didn't order my gunner to fire the heavy machine gun at 450 rounds a minute, seven bullets a second. We really chewed these 14 people up. I found out later they were Australians. They shouldn't have been there. If I had have killed them, it would have been their fault but it was still being on my conscience. Another time we found two Malay soldiers, one shot in the feet and the other shot in the neck. So I got out the first aid kit and plugged his uh, wound in the neck to stop the bleeding and got out an ampoule of morphine, that's toothpaste, and gave him a shot in the arm of morphine dipped my finger in the blood that was oozing out of his neck and wrote in blood the letter M on his forehead. That was to uh, indicate to the medical people, if he got there, that he'd been given an injection. But he knew he was dying, and so did everyone else. Worst stories I won't relate. In daylight... It's all in a day's military operation. Violent death is a part of life. But at night, on your own in bed, you start to seriously wonder as to the future state of yourself. Whether you will go to heaven or not. And as my 12 years service was nearly up, we were due to go to the troubles in Protestant and Catholic uh, Northern Ireland next. So it went from Jewish terrorists in Palestine to communist terrorists in Malaya. And it would have gone to Irish Republican Army terrorists in Northern Ireland. I said, it's time to stop. So paragraph 26, in due course, I came to New Zealand. And I started to search for answers to life's problems. I went to a Billy Graham crusade in Auckland. But all that is emotional religion. I went to political meetings. Vernon Cracknell, Hugh Watt, Reno Tedekartney. I asked these people what I thought were uh, awful questions and wrote letters to the press and to the star. And Ah, oh, did I? No, we don't no. want that one. We want uh, the, um, yes, we want the Christadelphia advertisement, please. Thank you. Now, that's not the half-page advert in the star, but it's the uh, same subject matter. That's taken from uh, a personal handout. This is, then, the Christadelphia advertisement, or similar, uh, and on there is Christ's, why we claim Christ's coming is imminent. And that took me back 23 years to the vicar's remark in the sermon in 1940. Christ will return to the earth. Puzzle number four. So, a sharp turn. River Jordan twisting and turning, a sharp turn 
in the journey of life for me. My wife and I went to Sunday evening public addresses, Thursday evening Bible classes, and we asked questions and got satisfactory answers. Prove it. Bible boast. So let's go back now to para 29 and Exodus chapter 3 that I read when I was five and a half or six, puzzle number two. The burning bush was a prophecy. The bush represented Israel, tormented, persecuted by the Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Romans and Nazis. Yet the Jews had never been wiped out. They've been burnt, but not destroyed. They still exist. Predicted and fulfilled. But one more to come. Now we found in item 19 that when Hitler's war machine overran all those countries, Jews and undesirables were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. In fact, the policy was in force in Germany before 1938. Hitler's mother had cancer. Her doctor was a Jew, and he was exempt from arrest. Now, um, we need two, oh, two pictures, please. One of Captain Frank Foley. Thank you. Right, who was Captain Frank Foley? He was a British Army officer in World War I, and later joined... MI6, Military Intelligence 6, and became passport control officer in Berlin between the wars. And many displaced people were wandering around, and if they were Jews, he was successful in getting them a passport so that they could escape Nazi Germany. Because of his work, he was awarded the Jewish uh, accolade, righteous among the nations. Now, we want to look at Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16, the next picture, please. Right, now it's down in your notes, but what do we find in Jeremiah 16, verse 16? It says, I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. The British ambassador to Berlin wrote in 1939, that is, Sir Neville Henderson there, he wrote this, right? Large numbers of Jews have been hauled off and the catch is examined. Now when you go fishing, you throw the net over the side and you catch fish and you haul the net back onto the deck and open it up and you examine what type of fish you have caught. Now what Sir Neville Henderson wrote that uh, Jews have been hauled off and the cash is examined isn't that in Jeremiah 16, verse 16? I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And the other item up on the board there is what Captain Frank Foley wrote. Well, in the Bible it says, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them. And Foley wrote, the Jews have been hunted like rats in their homes. So the Nazi Holocaust was predicted and fulfilled. The Bible is true. So paragraph 30. This extreme persecution was leading up to the fulfillment of God's purpose with the Jews and the world. And if we look at the prophecy of Ezekiel 37 and read it slowly and carefully, what do we find? A valley of dry bones scattered everywhere. 
Listen to what God has to say, verse 4. The bones were correctly reassembled into their skeletons. The bodies were rebuilt. And all this represented, in verse 11, it represented Israel. When alive, they will return to their own land, verses 12 and 14, not the Palestinians' land. God is in control, verse 21, predicted and partially fulfilled. I say partially, the first two points have been fulfilled. Surely, why shouldn't the third, that they will have one king, be fulfilled? But what does Ezekiel 37 also teach us? A body being rebuilt from the ground and made alive represents the nation of Israel. Resurrection, standing to life again. When did it die? AD 70, at the hands of the Romans. And the resurrection would succeed even if man tried to prevent it. Paragraph 31. Not only is the world's most valuable piece of real estate to be the Jewish homeland, and not the Palestinians and not the British, but those who try and frustrate God's purpose will be pushed aside. God's eyes are upon that land from the beginning of the year to the end. Deuteronomy 11 verse 12. So God has a body. He has eyes. He has feelings and passions. He feels for those people, his people, and the land. And that contradicts that first of the 39 articles of the Church of England's doctrine. So one is right and one is wrong. The Church of England is wrong and the Bible is right. Now if we go back to that photo of uh, Haifa, please. Right, there was a photo up there a little earlier on of the docks at Haifa. I took that photo on Friday the 7th of May 1948 as I was on a troop ship going from Egypt back to England to do a port and we called in at Haifa and took on about 3,000 British troops that were being uh, evacuated from that land as Britain was now uh, withdrawing and it had lost the mandate to govern that country. Remember that picture that was up there? So I took that a week before the uh, nation of Israel came into being. I think in those days we were all pro-Arab. There's lots of British weapons were secretly sold to the Arabs. Para 32. Leaves and fl- flags flutter in the breeze. One of the many parables, a story with a hidden meaning, spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 21, he said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. The fig tree is one of the many symbols of Israel. The maple tree Canada, the oak tree, England, the silver fern, New Zealand. From about 1947, many countries that were colonies under the European rule wanted independence. Burma, India, Ceylon, Indonesia from the Dutch, other countries. The Jews wanted the British out. More and more flags appeared at the United Nations and new countries. When Uh, leaves appear, you know that summer is nigh, therefore harvest is near, therefore time of judgment and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what do I mean by the 1935 map? At our school, above the fireplace, there was a huge map and most of that map, sorry, a quarter of that map was red the British dominions, the colonies, the British Empire. Go forward to 1947, and the red started to evaporate. Israel, paragraph 33, was a little different. 
It was a new country, a new name on the map, with a flag not seen in modern times. It had died in AD 70, but in May 48, a week after I was in Haifa, it had come back from the dead. A body, political, living again, with its own language, predicted and fulfilled in Ezekiel 37, page 3 of your notes, paragraph 34. So, was its rebirth such a shock? It shouldn't have been. Christadelphian writers since 1849 had predicted it, and even a few before that who understood, understood the Bible. A Jewish scientist had helped the British war effort in World War I by inventing an explosive, a propellant for artillery shells. And as a reward for vital Jewish help, the British government views with favour a homeland for the Jews. And not so long ago, Theresa May said that this document, the Balfour Declaration of November 17, was the most important in history. 1947, the United Nations voted to end the British mandate in Palestine. Well, there are 35, if the British were to cease from trying to govern the Holy Land, who would replace them? No problem. The Jews themselves. Paragraph 36. Again, let us look at natural things to learn spiritual lessons. Before a woman has a baby, she passes through three stages, named trimesters. The first, the second, and the third. And then a new life me, comes into the world. The biblical lesson, first trimester, World War I. Millions dead. Yet out of that, the Balfour Declaration promised a national homeland. Second trimester, World War II. Millions dead in warfare and in the Holocaust in concentration camps. The Jews then got the impetus to migrate to Palestine and make a go of it. The third trimester, World War III. Millions will die and... Russia will sweep down through the king of the north, Ezekiel 38, and uh, will sweep down into Egypt. And Ezekiel 39, verse 11, God will bury Russia in Israel. Israel's borders will be extended. And Christ will be king over all the world. So after three world wars, three trimesters, there will be a new world order. And he wants helpers. 37, para 37. Christ's return, which the vicar mentioned so long ago for me, means resurrection and judgment. John chapter 5, Daniel 12. Rejection for some, acceptance for others. And this answered puzzle 4. Some dead people can come back the life that answered puzzle three and live forever answered puzzle one and of course the meaning of the burning bush puzzle two was answered would ordinary politicians be able to solve world's the world's social problems puzzle five of course not para 38 peace in our time said neville chamberlain this worthless piece of paper at Croydon Airport in 1938. When Christ rules the world, there will be lasting world peace. It will break out and be glory to God in the highest. The Bible is not a collection of worthless pieces of paper, but an up-to-date political and social book. When, para 39, well that's a critical question. You will have noticed all puzzles in my life's journey to seek answers have been answered by references to and associated with Israel. Matthew 24. Again, many people are alive today who can remember 
1948, May the 14th, and even long before that. But there are fewer of us still alive who have actually been there and done that and been involved in that land unknowingly trying to frustrate God's purpose. My stepmother's father at Gallipoli in 1915 and me in Palestine in 1947. Item 40. A question on that leaflet. What's in store for New Zealand and the world? Everyone is curious what happens in the future. This political book, the Bible, has the answer. And it takes us to the next thousand years. To start, deep trouble. Perilous times, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Luke 21, distress of nations without a way of escape. No human government can solve the many crises that are affecting the world today. The population explosion, the refugees, the famines, the storms, the floods, the rising sea levels, the shortage of food because of all these things happening, climate change, wars. Luke 17, the disciples asked Jesus to look into the future and tell them what the situation would be like when he was due to return. So he told them that those who fail to learn from the mistakes of history 2,000 years ago, from when he was speaking, 2,000 years previously, they were destined to make the same mistakes again. And he pointed out to Genesis 6 and Genesis 19, those would happen again. Genesis 6, Noah's day, the earth filled with corruption and violence. Genesis 19, Lot's day, Sodom and Gomorrah. A heavily oversexed society. Passions are inflamed. So the punishment will fit the crime. God will incinerate them. And as New Zealand is situated on the Pacific Rim of fire, be warned. Para 41, two pictures please. Do you understand political cartoons? Yes. All right, we have some political cars things there. We only got half of one, but you look in the newspaper and you see certain events that are depicted uh, by strange pictures. We'll just deal with half the one here. That is Helen Clark. She is the hare, the hare and the tortoise. The tortoise has found itself underneath a truck. I don't know what the significance of all that was. But here, the one in the middle, is December the 1st, 1975, a Saturday, I can remember that one. And down the bottom, there is a chicken. That is uh, Wallace Rowling, the leader of the Labour Party, uh, is now no longer Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister now is now crowing heavily like a rooster on the... Uh, Farmyard muck heap is uh, Rob Muldoon, and over on the right is General Ariel Sharon, Ariel Sharon of Israel. Uh, recognize him, but he, with talons, is about to deliver a rocket to someone. I don't know whether it's the Palestinians, Lebanese, or who. But now, if we turn to the Bible, please. The next picture. Thank you. Right. So in the Bible, you take your first step on the journey towards the re-establishment of the kingdom of God. In the Bible, you will find political cartoons. And they can be understood. The that one there is from the book of Daniel, but there are many more in the book of Revelation. They're all understandable. God wants our time. He wants our intelligence. We shall not journey this way again. So today is the day of opportunity. You might, like me, have to do a U-turn from being pro-Arab to being pro-Arab. Israel, 
because we look forward to uh, that is our salvation, the hope of Israel. Israel is the center, will be the center of the world government in the future. So the benefits of finding the truth, which I did, and God willing, I hope you do the same, are living forever on this earth and helping the Lord Jesus Christ to put all the social problems right. Thank you.